Uh, but I'm talking about fear and the law. Uh, just very briefly, um, so you know a little bit about me. I am a solicitor, I've been practicing in intellectual property, including trademarks and copyright for 15 years. I work for a firm called Baldwin's IP with the offices in Wellington, Auckland, Mandan, um, Christchurch. Uh, I do a limited amount of work for my favourite client, to the breweries, uh, but I also work for a number of other industries. Um, during this talk, please do feel free to ask Sorry. questions. Sorry. <laughs> I'll get rid of it. Feel free to go raise more questions um, on my whole of the slides. Um, most of them are just pretty much anyway. So, this will know a bit of perhaps about uh, you uh, and all of us as well. So, hand up in the industry. Someone give free advice. Good. Uh, is anyone here right? a home brewer looking to get into commercialising their hobby? It's a, a, good, a good start to have you guys here. Hands up if you're someone trying to explain the Radler case. <laughs> There's always one or two. Great. So I mean, what I'm going to do is give a pretty uh, general overview of um, intellectual property law. It's obviously a vast subject, so it's necessarily going to be quite brief. I'll then focus on some basics of trademark law, uh, particularly how it pertains to brewing and beer industry, uh, what makes a good trademark uh, legally, what makes a good trademark for marketing, how you want to go about deciding what to trademark and how um, Obviously, because I'm on the way, I have to put a caveat on here. None of this is legal advice. If you do want to uh, say negative advice, then have seen that. I'll um, put some business cards out as well if you want to get in touch later on. In my view, the brewing industry is not really a manufacturing industry. It's really an intellectual property industry. Uh, the key assets of successful brewery tend to be intellectual property based. A lot of the value of brewing businesses is in the name, reputation, uh, the recipes, and obviously the know how the people involved in it particularly for us in brewery. Uh, you can have all the capital assets in the world, all the stainless steel you like, but none of that is any good um, without the IP that is behind it. Um, you can almost view a contract during a brewing company as an IP holding company with distribution arm, if you like. Um, the involvement of individuals is, of course, quite important, um, but again, the value actually lies in the reputation and the goodwill that that person has created through their brand. Um, at the macro, Level. You can imagine if an outfit like DB split into two parts. One part kept all the hardware, the other part kept all of their brands, DB, TUI, Monteith, and all the distribution licenses for foreign beers. You can imagine which one's going to be worth the most in two years' time. It would be the one with all the brands uh, sitting behind it. The craft end of the beer manufacturing spectrum is perhaps a little bit different to that, but obviously you can see that Lion understood the value not just having the innocent's name, but having the innocent's man there as well. Whether that is true of all smaller breweries um, is a good question. Could there be a Yeasty Boys without the Yeasty Boys? Probably not. Could there be a Moa without Josh Scott? Quite possibly. So IP protection is, is vital, in my view, uh, in, the, in the brewing industry. There are various types of IP that are relevant. Uh, trademarks, which are Protection of brand name is probably the most important one. Uh, the other form of registered property uh, IP probably isn't so important for brewing patents to protect inventions. Of course, there are also registered designs, 3D shapes and designs. Perhaps you had a particularly fancy one that might be useful, but I won't be addressing other patent registered designs today. Uh, if you're more into the horticulture side of things, you can get a plant variety right. And just for your interest, there are currently eight hop varieties registered in New Zealand, all of them by the New Zealand Institute of Plant and Food Research. Um, there are currently no yeasts registered, although that is possible because the system defines plants to include a fungus, which will probably disturb the scientists amongst you, but there you go, that's the law for you. In terms of unregistered IP rights, of course you've got copyright, and that generally protects things like literary, artistic and other works. In the brewing industry, that's going to be your beer labels, and your, uh, and your tap badges and that sort of thing. 
Payments, as I mentioned, a couple of mentions. I'm not going to be covering that today. It's not uh, strictly a registered mechanism uh, you drawing kit. The other sorts of unregistered rights that I won't be touching on in great detail include protection of confidential information uh, and the protection of know-how. And if that's not confidential in reality, it's very difficult to prevent someone other than by time up um, contractually. So uh, on to trademarks. Now it's not compulsory in New Zealand to register a trademark, you simply use your brand, but uh, there's certain benefits to registration. The main benefit is not really that it gives you the chance to make a legal claim against someone else using the same brand. The main benefit, in my view, is that someone can look up on the register, see you're there, and they won't even step on your toes in the first place. They'll choose a different name because you've stated publicly you've claimed that name uh, and it is yours. And most honest people don't seek to infringe trademark. It's usually inadvertent, they're importing a product with the same name. They haven't done a careful search, they just don't know that um, you exist. Trademark registration is a relatively simple way for a well informed person, anyway, to be aware of your prior claim to a brand name. It's important to remember that a trademark is only a national right, there's no such thing as an international trademark. There are certain um, procedures and systems where you can more easily obtain trademarks around the world through making one application that's then split amongst a number of countries. But in each case, you only get a national right in each country. Filing a trademark in New Zealand is not going to be of any use to you in Australia, the States or the EU, for example. Perhaps an uh, example of that is that uh, maybe if you have a feral brewing in Australia, well, there's a company here called MBL Marlborough who's registered the trademark feral for beer, the Australians thought they had all the reputation in their name and tried to knock it off, and it was no go. The New Zealand company won, they were the first, and they got to keep their trademark. You may have seen alongside some of those brands either the R and a circle mark or the TM mark. Those two have specific meanings. If your trademark is registered, you're entitled to use the R in a circle, which tells the world this is a registered trademark, do not use it. If it's not registered, you can also use the TM symbol it simply means you're claiming rights to it without having registered it. And I would strongly encourage anyone who has a brewery name or a name for a beer that goes beyond the description of the style, if they're not registering the trademarks, to use the TM. It will make your life much uh, easier should you need to try and protect your right without trademark registration. I have up here words versus logos. Now this is a point that it's quite, um, it seems obvious to a trademark lawyer, but it's a point often overlooked by businesses. You can register a, your logo as a trademark, or you could register just the words. The difference is, if you register only your logo, then that is the only protection you have. Unless someone's copying both your name and the logo, you're not going to stop them using the same name. The better option is to protect the words. If you could register New Zealand Lager, you'd be in a good position. I don't think you can. But what has been registered is that logo on the right. And that's not going to prevent anybody else calling it their New Zealand lager, but it will prevent them using the same or a similar logo. As well as words and logos, it is possible to register other types of trademarks. Uh, we call them non-traditional trademarks, such as colours, shapes, sounds and smells. In New Zealand, no one has yet managed to register a smell as a trademark, largely because it's a requirement to in writing. It's quite hard to actually write down what a smell is. And um, I did wonder whether yeasty boys might have a go at registering the smell of Rick's attitude. Um, <laughs> some commenters said it smells a lot like one of security guards at work, <laughs> or burning tires with suit and cork, a broken bottle of lighting and shard barbecue aubergine. And my favourite, the smell of pissing on a fire to put it out. <laughs> So as well as recording your trademark uh, graphically, either in writing or as a logo, what else do you need to do to register a trademark? Yeah. Well, it's actually not very difficult to go onto the icons on the property office on the website and they step through the process. There's an official fee of dollars and you can pretty much do it yourself. If you have no other option, then that's better than nothing. However, I would recommend that you do get proper advice before filing a trademark because not only uh, can you get advice on which goods and services you might register for? 
we can have discussions about which logos, which names, what is your overall strategy, and like most things, having a professional do it, you get a better result, but it tends to cost a bit more, much like um, brewing. Once you've got your application filed, that's not the end of the story. And I have seen examples where someone has filed their own trademark online, thought that was the end of it, but because they didn't follow through the entire process, they didn't end up getting a trademark registration at the end of it. Once you've got your application and the trademark office looks at it, uh, and makes their own decisions to whether or not that is registrable. I'll get on to why that might not be the case uh, shortly. If there are any issues, they issue an examination report to you or to your trademark lawyer, and you must respond to that. That's quite crucial. If you ignore it, the application just dies. Uh, if you deal with any examination issues that have come up, then the trademark is accepted for publication. It's published in the official journal online, and then there's a six month period in which anyone else can oppose that trademark. And getting into a poser trademark is usually slightly easier than trying to get it knocked off the register once it's been um, registered. So there's a six month period of opposition, then you have your trademark registration. And they used to send you a nice certificate, but now you see that. It's not quite the same as it used to be. So, what then is a good trademark? Well, the purpose of a trademark ultimately is to distinguish one trader's goods from another trader's goods, in this case. Uh, one brewer's beer from another brewer's beer. There are two aspects to this. First of all, obviously, it must distinguish the trader's goods from somebody else's generally. So you can't have a descriptive trademark like New Zealand Lager. Um, they're a project of bravely trying to use beer as a brand on its own. Very clever, very funny, but they can't register that on the This is another example, Kiwi Lager. Words on the line wouldn't be registrable, too descriptive, so we've gone for the logo instead. The other aspect, of course, is um, that names can become, descriptive names, sorry, can become uh, distinctive through use. Now, TB has managed to get a registration for the Great Kiwi Lager. It took them six years to do it, but they got rid of the end, probably by filing evidence of use. Another example which, um, was involved with. At the beginning of my career 15 years ago was Lion's application for the word red. There's some descriptive connotation in there. It took them 11 years of examination to get that through the trademark office. 10 years of oppositions from both DB and Carlton United, but they got there in the end, having spent over 20 years trying to push that onto the trademark office. Imagine what that would cost them in legal fees. So if you're going to try and register a descriptive mark, be prepared to spend a bit of cash on it. Better option is probably just to choose a trademark in the first place. In terms of other descriptive marks I've come across, um, Sober, who I have done some work recently, suggested to a small contract for a wide group, that's Farmhouse, wasn't their best trademark application ever, and they withdrew that on the strength of um, one letter. Um, and of course, perhaps more famously, at the time that the rabbit issue arose, DB also had the trademark for Saison. So rather wisely just had cancelled rather than fight alongside Radler. As well as not being descriptive, it's important that a trademark is uh, distinct from other uh, traders' marks as well. You need to be sure that your brand or your logo is not going to be confusing or deceptively similar to somebody else's mark. If it is, it's possible to get around it by consent. If you know the person, you can just write a letter and say, would you mind signing this? and the icons will accept someone else's consent as indicating it's not confusing or deceptive. Uh, having had a look at what's on the trademark register, you might be familiar with a uh, Hawaiian beer called Longboard. Uh, the same outfit in Waipu who tried to reach the farmhouse also has Longboarder beer, and they have got that on register by consent between the two of them. So they've, they've agreed a way in which they can coexist in the market. And in, in an industry like craft beer, often people are happy for someone to coexist as long as there's no real risk of confusion, they'll find a way uh, around it. There is a bit of a tension, of course, between a good trademark from a legal perspective being something distinctive and unique and easy to register and something good from a marketing perspective, which you want to describe uh, beer, at least to an extent. So lawyers like unique, inventive words and phrases. Marketers tend to like the descriptive types of mark, like Kiwi Lager. Competitors aren't averse to getting a bit cheeky about things as well. Um, in 1955, as the New Zealand beer market was opening up, uh, a beer began to be imported 
this later on, you may recognise a small local brewer called um, Lion decided to launch a competing product with that label. They didn't end up using the word Steinecker, they changed that to Steinlager pretty quickly because massive litigation quickly ensued after they tried to register that particular label. So the aim really is to try and get a balance between the two. You need to have a, a mark that's registrable, preferably, but has some sort of reference to the good. The way an IP law describes having a skillful allusion to the goods or services, something like Port and Noir is a great one. That's how it tells beer. Yeah, that's such a good name. DB's Monteith tried to steal that one as well. So we make a couple of doing that. So the, the beer samples we have today are attempts to illustrate some of these um, points. I'm not sure which one we have up first, but hopefully this is Fork Brewing's base jumper. So Fork Brewing, nothing to do with, with uh, brewing beer. In fact, they've taken the part of the establishment's name that doesn't say brewer, it says Fork and Steps. That's a great name from an IP lawyer's point of view for a brewery. And again, base jumper doesn't really mean much uh, in respect of beer, so that should be a nice easy trademark to register, which they haven't done. So there you go. Not bad either. At the other end of the scale, uh, we'll be having Tiaro Brewing Company's Chardonnay Barrel Fermented Brett IPA. Tiaro Brewing Company, as I understand it, is a brewing company in Tiaro. You couldn't get a much more descriptive name than that, and given the number of the breweries in Wellington, I'd be very lucky to get that sort of a name uh, through the trademark office. Equally, the name of the beer is essentially the description of it. Um, I'm not sure if there are any other Chardonnay Barrel Fermented Brett IPAs, but it's that almost replicates exactly the tasting notes given on the Avana app that I see. So that wouldn't be a very good choice from a lawyer's point of view. From a marketer's point of view, it's great. It tells the customer where the brewery is and what's in the So that the, in the middle, there's a bit of a happy medium to the third beer that we'll be having today is Balin's Area 650. Balin's gives some hint of where the brewery is, but unless you're familiar with Street names of Valentine, you might not know exactly where it is. Area 650 is quite clever. That's the area code for San Francisco where many famous West Coast breweries are um, established, including lots of steam anchor and, of course, being a West Coast IPA. There's that skill for moving I was talking to earlier. So I think that's a very good uh, beer name and one that would be easy to trademark and quite useful for the marketers as well. Point end, infringement. Once you've got your trademark, what, what happens when someone uses the same mark? There are a range of different ways a trademark can be infringed. These are the two main ones. The first one is where someone's using an identical trademark, that is, identical means identical, exactly the same words or exactly the same logo in respect of the same goods for which you've registered your trademark. And that, that anything more, will be an infringement. So that was the case uh, in Radler. DB had the word Rattler registered. Green Man put the word Rattler on the beer. There it is, trademark infringement. Even if no one's really going to be confused or mix the two up, that was enough to give them a pretty good legal case. The only possible defence there would be that no, no one would take the use of Rattler to be used as a trademark, i.e. they're using it descriptively. That's quite difficult if something's front and centre on your label. If it was the word red contained in the description of the beer, i.e. Green Man Cyclist is a redless style beer, you're probably going to get away with it. But to put it up front and bold on your label is always going to be a problem, given the registration. The second type of infringement is where you have a similar mark and only uh, an identical or similar goods. In that case, you need to also show that there be a likelihood of confusion. And likelihood of confusion is a bit of a grey area and it can really um, depend on what evidence you have and how the judge feels on the day as to whether or not they agree is a likelihood of confusion. If you can show there's been actual confusion, then you're in a good spot. If you're trying to stop someone who's just launched a beer with your trademark on it, then trying to show actual confusion is almost impossible because no one's had a chance to be confused yet. So you need to go with likelihood, and that often comes down to how similar are the marks. Now, by way of illustration, this is not an infringement case. This was a case where someone was opposing that trademark on the basis that it was too similar to theirs that was already registered. So this mark here, registered for beer, Tiger Beer, I think most, most of you 
most of us will be familiar with that. Someone came along with this for RTD style drinks, not beer at all. Now, not only did the trademark office for me that those marks were similar, the both a picture of a tiger and the word tiger in them, they also rather depressingly found that RTDs were similar to beer. <laughs> so you don't have to be all that close to start treading on people's toes. The test will be a bit tighter if you're talking about infringement, but that's in the, in the ballpark there. I expect I've never been served the, the second one on the list. That's very nice to that one. There are defences to allegations of trademark in front of the of course. I've mentioned use not likely to be taken as trademark use, which is a long and boys way of saying descriptive use. That's generally okay. If you if you're first in time, if you've got prior continuous use, then that can be a defence to someone who's later registered the trademark you were using, and you didn't have uh, enough sense to oppose it. If you've got your own registration, that's the same, and that is also a defence. Uh, there's also a defence of using your own name. Now that only applies to individuals using their actual name. You can't just start up a company and give it the name you want to use that's already been taken. And it's also a defence to argue that the trademark being asserted against you is either invalid or could be revoked. I'll talk a little bit of that later on. Essentially, invalidity means the trademark should never have been registered, and non uh, revocation means that the trademark has become uh, unregisterable since it was first on the register. The main way you show that a trademark ought to be revoked is that it either hasn't been used for three years or that it's become generic. An interesting case uh, is Duff Beer, which you might recognised from um, Simpsons, and that's been a Duff Bear registration in New Zealand since 1999. Um, Fox has had that registered. No one's yet challenged it for non-use in New Zealand, but in some countries you actually need to prove use without anyone even challenging it in order to maintain a registration. So Fox has had to launch Duff Bear in a few countries around the world. I think the first one was in Chile. There are other people have tried to also um, launch their own Duff Bears, which Fox has tried to squash, but they haven't got their registration for beer to be in a bit different form. Uh, I mentioned before you can have a trademark revoked for becoming more generic. It's not that simple. Not only does the name have to have become generic, but it has to have become generic due to the acts or activity of the owner, which is probably why if anyone chose to now launch a red or a beer, they'd get a nasty letter from D. They'd probably go past that. They're not likely, I think, to risk their good name again, we're getting too bullshit about it, but they need to show they've taken a step to try and protect it, because otherwise uh, everyone starts launching a red style beer, eventually that name will become generic in the eyes of the law, and that registration uh, could finally be knocked off, which would be a bad thing in my view. If you are found to infringe what's going to happen to you, the main remedy uh, is an injunction, preventing further infringing sales, this would be the Balaam 650. I was recently at a, an IP law conference in San Diego, which was the best place possibly that have chosen to have one. Anyway, back to the topic. If you are found in France, the main remedy will be an injunction. Um, it's possible to seek an urgent injunction before you've had your actual trial on an interim basis. Uh, usually that would actually deal with the matter if someone's lost at that stage, they're unlikely to um, spend thousands of dollars defending themselves for the full trial. Uh, and a trial with a permanent injunction and of course an award of damages, usually calculated by what the trademark owner has lost, or possibly a fair royalty fee if they can't demonstrate that they're making sales themselves. So, what should you trademark? I'm speaking out of those that you are either in or looking to get into uh, the brewing industry. There is obviously a cost associated with it, and um, most IP laws will recognise that. My recommendation, generally, would be that a brewery name should always be registered in the trademark. Mostly because there's a very good chance, given the number of craft breweries worldwide, that someone's already got the same or similar name to you, and that eventually they're going to want to send their beers to New Zealand. If you register your name, you're not going to stop them doing that if you are okay with it, but it gives you the chance to say no. And a word of warning, 
Registering a company does not give you any rights to your company name. There's no trademark rights attached to a company registration. All that does is prevent someone registering exactly the same company name, and I mean exact, adding the word Inc or New Zealand or a year to a company name will make it registrable over another one. Now, bear names are a bit trickier. Should you register all your bear names is the question I'd be asked, and the answer to that is usually no, because a lot of your bear names, particularly if you've got a core range of a Pilsner and a Porter and an IPA, are going to be descriptive anyway, so you're not going to get those registered. If you wanted some protection, you could register your beer labels for those. If you've got any particularly unique names or you've got seasonal one-offs that again have a unique name, then you may want to consider registering those. But probably not as important as the brewery name itself. If you've got a particularly good seller that uh, somebody wish to try and copy, then again, I'd recommend registration of those names. Um, if you don't have a registration, then you're going to have to rely on your own reputation and that name, either under the Fair Trading Act or, the talk, or passing off to prevent someone using it. And the Port and Noir case, now I understand that that was sorted out by a phone call from Steve at Halatau to DB and was done and dusted. But they accepted that Halatau had sufficient reputation in the Port and Noir name without a registration to prevent them from using it. But I know that they now have gone ahead and registered the name to prevent it happening again. So what should you do if someone sends you that nasty letter saying you are using our trademark, please stop? Well, the first thing to do is to make sure you don't get in that position. Do some research, make sure you choose names that are free to use, take advice if you think that's necessary. If you do receive that letter, often your first reaction is, well, that's a bit scary, I better stop doing that straight away. I would caution against doing that immediately for two reasons. Firstly, it might be a trial. Someone may maybe like the federal brewing situation where in fact they have no New Zealand rights, they're just trying to grab their name before perhaps moving into reporting into New Zealand. So do get some advice on it. Most lawyers, myself included, would be happy to have at least an initial quick discussion of the facts before they start the clock and start charging the lawyers rates. Um, and that sort of advice can help you negotiate a graceful exit if you are in trouble. Rather than just stopping and accepting you owe someone damages they've claimed, you can usually negotiate something in a sell-out period perhaps, or even a coexistence agreement, either time-limited or a permanent one. So there are ways to deal with those sorts of issues without just giving up uh, and rolling over. Moving on um, quickly to copyright. Copyright is not registered in New Zealand, it is in some countries. It's a protection that arises automatically under statute for any artistic and literary works, meaning basically drawings and writing. Um, there are other protected works as well, such as broadcasts and so forth, but they're not really relevant to this talk. To be protected by copyright, something must be original, but there's a pretty low threshold for originality. Essentially anything other than a copy itself is going to have some degree of protection. And the more original something is, then the more protected it is. I would hazard a guess that most garage project labels will have a stronger copyright than the beer label I mentioned earlier, which is the word beer on a white background. So that can protect your logos, protect your labels. It's infringed by what's called substantial reproduction, i.e. copying in normal English. The tricky part usually is not proving that something looks the same, but it's proving that you actually own the copyright. Because it's not registered, there's no official record of who owns what. And it has to be tied back to who actually did the writing made the drawing, who the author is. The only way that copyright can be transmitted is either through an employer-employee relationship, a contractual relationship, or in writing. So the one piece of advice I would give to you, uh, particularly those in the growing industry, if you are having a designer or your mate or your flatmate or someone else draw your labels for you or design your logo, get with the right put in writing, the copyright owner belongs to you. That's all it takes, it's pretty straightforward. You don't need to pay them anything for it. As long as they agree in right that it's your copyright, and if you fall out with them, you get to keep the labels. This one over here, they are falling out with their designer and faced a $1.8 million claim in the States uh, when they started using a label that someone had drawn for them. They only changed the name, they changed the October 5th from being straight to being slightly curved. I'm not sure what happened in the end in that case. Um, litigation was started and then it obviously disappeared, so it presumably there's some sort of a, a payout and a settlement. There. Another interesting copyright case, again, Simpsons. Even though 
in most cases, and at this time there was no actual Duff beer, there's still copyright in the Duff can. So when uh, I think it was Ryan Nathan decided to have a crack at the Duff market in Australia, they were very careful to make their can a little bit different, but they still used the same name. So although they were sued, they weren't sued for copyright infringement, they only sued for uh, passing off, which is essentially when you're stealing someone's reputation. And in fact, in that case, the evidence of the brand development from Ryan Nathan clearly showed that they're trying to draw a deliberate connection with the Simpsons. It was a rather enlightening um, view as to how you market beer to 18 to 25 year olds um, with a, a brand that they expect to last for maybe a year or two, and then they uh, drop it. It's what they call a hot product. They put it out there, smash and grab reputation in the Simpsons, and end it. That does bring us on to the Fair Trading Act. Uh, there's a similar piece of legislation in Australia, and the main principle under this is thou shalt not engage in misleading and deceptive conduct in trade, and using confusing names can fall into that category. The famous case in New Zealand, Monteith Summer Ale was a big hit when it first came out. Lions thought, we'll get on that market too, and they put out Sundance Summer Ale, the DB being who they are, and had a whinge about it. In the end, it was sensibly found that, first of all, Summer Ale is descriptive, they can't have any reputation in that, Word itself, the two bottles look quite different. No one's going to be confused, so there's no case. It's interesting to think about what cases there might be if someone was minded to um, have a go. When such things as crafty beggars first came out and the corporate origins were quite well hidden, um, there's potentially an argument that's misleading and deceptive. And certainly, given the broader knowledge of beer styles in New Zealand now, the phrase East India Pale Ale. Applies to certain brands, it does start to record into question. So, if anyone wants to get this piece of documentation, you want to have a go at TV, let me know. <laughs> I'm going to very briefly talk about the Australia and New Zealand Food Standards Code. It's not a particularly riveting piece of reading to do. But that's what it might be interesting. Beer means the product, character of Presence of hops, start. Fermentation of unloaded or unloaded cereals, or both. That's pretty good. Fitness to bear, and this might just do some, but I'm not sure how fast you are. Fitness to bear includes fitness to able to thought out, doing different things in, in the eyes of the law, at least. And the yeasty boy should read this part. The following foods <coughs> may be added to bear during production. Cereal products, obviously. Other sources of carbohydrate? What might that be? Sugar, salt, do you put salt in there, bit? Yeah. Herbs and spices. Now, I'm not sure if tea is a herb, but it's there. Now, there's no penalty for not following this definition. But strictly speaking, if you put anything else in your um, product characterized by the presence of hops, that's not technically a beer. And you may run into trouble because if you're not a bear, then you're going to be captured by all the other food regulations that bears exempt from, such as the wound labeling and so forth. So I've never heard of this being enforced, I've never heard of it being raised by the food standards people, but just a, a point of interest. Now, so there's at least one hand in cup I wanted to know a bit about the Bradley case. I have a few minutes. So, can anyone have any questions first before I get into this, which most people might know about? I'm happy to take some questions now. You talked earlier about uh, registration of trademarks. Yeah, we'll get you on the mic. You talked earlier about registration of trademarks yeah. and uh, I guess unused trademarks or trademarks mm -hmm. that have not been been applied commercially. How does it work? Where, for instance, looking looking online, quite a few company names registered with trademarks registered in different locations and clearly. Owned by the same individuals. How does that work? Is the, so, so challenging a registered trademark that hasn't been used commercially. If it hasn't been used for three years or more, mm -hmm. then you file an application with the IP office uh, saying that you need to, I mean, with your application, you need to put in some evidence of non use because evidence of an absence of that is quite difficult. So, you need to say, no, I've looked online. I've checked this directory, I can't see it used anywhere. 
um, the last use was four years ago. The owner then gets a chance to put the evidence on use. Now the test there, there can't be token or, or to pretend use designed to get around non-use, it has to be real. The test for that is whether or not it's been used to satisfy or create a market. So sales of even small volumes is usually enough to avoid replication. Something short of non can be put in advertising to save the day. Um, you can also avoid if you've got a good reason for non use, what's called special circumstances. Um, there's a, a case recently, and it's not really there at all, but the, it's a trademark for Red Nose Day. It hadn't been used because there was a, a dispute over the science behind cotton, essentially, and the only trademark that they couldn't keep running that particular charity until that scientific dispute had been resolved. That was seen as special circumstances, and there's a, a discretion on behalf of the Trademarks Commissioner to permit marks to stay on a recent example that um, I was involved in, what I would call CC's corn chips, back in the old days. Um, hadn't been used for three years by Bluebirds, so Griffin's applied to register <coughs> CC's itself and revoke Bluebirds mark, uh, and the residual reputation and the Bluebirds still held was sufficient for the Commissioner to exercise her discretion not to revoke the trademark in that case. That's your question. That's perfect. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. We'll have a quick run through Radler. So if anyone asks you about it, you can, you can pretend that you know what you're talking about. Uh, the Montes product, of course, came out in 2001 and was inexplicably popular from the start. <laughs> DB's put a, lot, put a lot of money and effort into promoting that brand and making it popular. And they've always maintained that the trademark they obtained was too protect and preserve that investment. And you have some certain sympathy for that, but someone's put some money into a brand, maybe they should have some rights in it. But it didn't file a trademark application until 2003. Now that's 12 years ago in human years, but it's aeons ago in craft beer years in New Zealand, if you think about it. It was sort of the end of the dark ages in 2003. So there's no town's ends, there's no sober, there's no epic. None of that. What there were were a few brew pubs and microbreweries around. I'm not sure what's happening in at that time. In Auckland, you had um, Shakespeare's and Cochrane, Bull and Galbraith's and the like. But certainly, uh, the breadth of their styles now available is just unheard of in New Zealand. That's the context we need to look at this case um, in. Because trademark validity is assessed at the time the application was made, so in 2003, not at the time you try and uh, declare invalid. And at the time the application was made, there was no opposition to it. No one was watching the register who cared, and the trademark went through without too much difficulty. So fast forward to 2008, Green Man has come into being. They have put out their own rattler, whether to try and cash in on the trend or because they thought it was a style of beer that might sell well, um, I don't know. I should point out I wasn't involved in this case uh, at all. DB, um, one uh, objected and probably quite fairly in the circumstances. They had a trademark on the register, someone's using it in a trademark kind of way on their beer. Um, and Green Man, I think that's the one of the need and not the Green Man in North Carolina because of their trademark issues. Uh, they could have argued that that use wasn't used likely to be taken as a trademark, but I don't think they would succeed it. It's not a descriptive use of brand, but it's there as part of their logo, as part of a brand. In any case, they took the low risk option, they restricted the beer, called it cyclist, and, and carried on. So in 2009, Sober um, picked up cudgels and took the flight to DB. And they sought to have Mark, they're both invalid, i.e., it should never have been registered, and have it revoked because it had become generic by that time. So they're trying to sort of fight both angles. DB actually accepted that in parts of Europe, the drink that we know as a shandy, a mixture of lager and lemonade, is known as a Rattler. But their point was that in 2003, Rattler had no meaning at all in New Zealand to the average consumer. And they're probably right on that. If you think about it, in 2003, most people wouldn't even know what Mike Vieira was, let alone what a Rattler was. And again, on the PR side, we're only trying to protect our investment in this brand. Essentially, the invalidity case then turned on 
where the SOPA could prove that in September 2003, a substantial number of New Zealanders would have known that a rattler was essentially a sham. Uh, there were some problems with the evidence they put forward on that, um, and I, my understanding is obviously the limited resources to review that evidence. The fact that most of it was from their experts didn't help because it should have been a bit from uh, average consumers, maybe a survey or something. But I suspect even if they'd done an absolute knowledgeable job with endless resources, they would have really struggled to find sufficient evidence to show that in 2003, people knew what a rambler was. So that leaves the revocation argument, but I'd need to show that by 2009, rambler had become generic due to the actual activity of the owner. Right there. That's quite an important point. And again, they couldn't really show that because there had been eight years of the Monteith's product on the market. If you said to the average partner in the pub, what's a rambler, that's how it's at Monteith's for you wouldn't have said, oh, it's a kind of shandy in one to make one version of it. So again, um, Sober didn't get home on that. So as you may have picked up, my view is that perhaps it is legally correct, although in this case, perhaps the law is less on that one. Um, <laughs> although Sober didn't win legally, I think they did win the PR battle. DB didn't pursue the costs of what they were given. They, they let that slide. And they've pretty much kept their nose clean ever since with a slightly poor and wire change which they claim was innocent. Um, I do wonder, however, how uh, honest they would be when they said they're just trying to protect their brands, what they normally do for our brands. These are the trademarks that they had registered in around about 1999 to 2000. That one based on 1985. They didn't try register words there, just the label. Extra bit of brown beer, obviously descriptive. They registered this label in 1999. In 2005, they tried to register the word style. My point's not there back. In 2007, uh, sorry, 2008, they tried again. And again, they got knocked back. So that one does do its job pretty well. Um, Bok, so sorry, um, sorry, Celtic, they tried to register the word Celtic in 1999. They gave up after two years of trial. These ones, they have never tried to register the words for. I think Pilsen would have been a bit of a push. I'm not sure if black beer is really a style, but they haven't tried to register that one either. Saison, they did try and succeeded, but they then abandoned it when Sober raised the point that it should never have been registered as a word. And obviously they haven't gone for Porto either. Slightly more esoteric style there. Again, they did go for the words, um, and after a year, they gave up on that one too, in the face of Icon saying no. The last one they tried to register in 2005, that label at the end, they didn't go for the words at all. So I think that shows that perhaps there was a bit of cynicism in DB around Rattler. They did try things that I don't normally do, but equally it shows that Icon does by and large do its job and keeps these descriptive trademarks out. So I think we're at the end of our lot of time. If any more questions, I'll be hanging around afterwards to the chat. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. I think we're just leaving all the cards questions after this. <laughs> we'll come around and pick up your interest as well.